Okay, um, so just to give a bit of background, especially for those who are new, since Christmas, we have been doing a series of sermons about Jesus, which is sort of logical because it starts at Christmas and it ends at Easter, okay? And in this series, we've had different segments. We've had some sermons on the season of joy, which is about responses to the infant Jesus, different people responding to him. And then we've had a season of preparation, which is about those hidden years when Jesus was a child and a, a boy and a man, and how he was doing things like, Mary gave a, a really interesting talk on Jesus as a teenager. And we learned a lot about teenagers. Uh, we didn't learn a lot about Jesus because there's nothing much written about him. Um, but uh, Nate did a, a really good sermon on work last Sunday. And um, so now uh, we come to the baptism. And after this one, we move to a new uh, season, a season of encounters, responses to the adult Jesus. But Jesus' baptism really acts as the turning point between his preparation and then his ministry, between the obscure years and then the public years. And to give you a bit of context about the coming of Jesus, I'd like to share an insight with you that I got while I was preparing this. Because the entry of the Son of God into this fallen world was an act of war. Now we don't often think of it as that, but actually it was. Because it was a full-on assault on enemy-held territory. In a way, it was like the D-Day landings in World War II. It was land that was occupied by an enemy. And there was massive assault, hundreds of thousands of people involved. Many years of preparation. So, lots of bloodshed, lots of... Uh, and in a way, that's what Jesus was doing when he came to this world as a tiny baby. Instead of hundreds of thousands of people involved, one baby. The Apostle John said, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That was his major reason for coming, to destroy the devil's work. He came to destroy the power of sin, the sin in our lives that we can't avoid. And the power of sin is death, because the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins will die. It's like an inevitable principle. So by destroying the power of sin, he also destroyed the power of death. He died for the sins of the whole human race, past, present, and future, in that one act on the cross. Only he could do it. Only he was both God and man. Only men can die. Only God is good enough to pay for the sins of the entire human race. One person can die for the sins of one person. Only God can die for the sins of the whole human race. And he came as God's final act of revelation. All through human history, God has been revealing himself to the world. He reveal, revealed himself in nature through the world he created. When you look at the stars, when you look at this beautiful planet, what an amazing God. He revealed himself in scriptures to the people he had chosen, the nation of Israel, the prophets who were called out from that. They wrote the scriptures. God revealed more about himself. But finally, in person, he revealed himself through the Son whom he sent. 
You know, the incarnation of the Son of God is arguably a greater miracle than the creation of the entire universe. Because when you think of what was happening, God himself, the creator of the universe, was being born as a human baby, fully human and fully God. Quite mind-boggling the more you think about it. Anyway, how was Jesus going to be revealed? He came as a baby, but how would he be revealed to the world? You know, the preparations for this were quite enormous. There was at least 2,000 years of preparation for the coming of Jesus. The calling of Abraham, the calling of Israel as a nation, Moses, all the prophets. A special nation was called into existence to be the nation in which the Messiah would come. Hundreds of prophecies were given to help people recognize him when he did come. But when he came, he was a human baby. And to be human is to be vulnerable. As soon as Jesus came and word began to spread, powerful people were alarmed. Herod sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to kill every child under the age of two. And Joseph had to take Jesus and Mary and flee to Egypt. And so Jesus spent his childhood, his boyhood, and his early manhood in obscurity, hidden from public sight. He was safe to live an ordinary human life, to have ordinary human experiences. First he lived in Egypt, and then he lived in Nazareth, which was a tiny little village in, in Galilee, well out of the way. So how would he be revealed? When would he be revealed? Would it be in a burst of glory so the whole nation would notice? Would it be a demonstration of power? How would it be? But God the Father had other plans, other preparations. There had been no prophet in Israel for 400 years. The Jewish people wondered if God had abandoned them. They called it the silence of heaven. So from the end of the Old Testament, the, uh, the end of the book of Malachi, there was a 400-year gap. And then suddenly, John the Baptist appeared in the desert, baptizing and preaching a message of repentance for sins. His coming had been foretold. Malachi, as I mentioned, the last prophet in the Old Testament, writing about 430 BC, said, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, writing about 700 BC, said, A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That was John's role, to prepare to prepare people for Jesus. John's birth had caused a stir. He was announced, as we all know, by the angel Gabriel in the temple to his unbelieving uh, father, Zechariah. And he was born miraculously to a childless couple in their old age, which has resonances with the birth of so many people in the Old Testament. I mean, just think of the promised child Israel, the promised uh, child um, Isaac, you know, the promised child, um, Samson. All, all sorts of people in the Old Testament had been born as a result of a promise to unlikely people. He came as the first Jewish prophet in 400 years. He came as a prophet in the spirit of Elijah. And he wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt, which is the only description we have of Elijah in the Old Testament. People were very excited, and large crowds flocked down to the River Jordan to hear him and to be baptized. And so you have an audience prepared and ready, an audience conscious of their sins, wanting to get right with God, being prepared for the coming of the Lord. 
being prepared for Jesus to be revealed. But what was Jesus doing in coming to John for baptism? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus had no sin. He didn't need to be baptized. Even John the Baptist sort of objected. So why choose baptism as a way of announcing his coming to Israel? There is a mystery here. But in coming for baptism, I think Jesus was doing a number of things. And he may be doing, have been doing lots more, but these are the ones that came to me. Firstly, in his baptism, he was identifying with sinful humanity. On the cross, Jesus would be our representative, the one perfect human being who could pay for the sins of the whole human race. Jesus could represent us. And so at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus took part in an act of repentance as our representative, turning away from sin and being washed clean on our behalf, not on his own behalf, because he didn't have any sin. So in the Jordan, he stood with us in repentance and sorrow. But on the cross, he's died for us in agony and love. Secondly, I think baptism is an act rich in symbolism. Going down into the water symbolizes death. Rising from the waters symbolizes new life. And in baptism, Jesus was showing in symbol, in acted prophecy, like so many Old Testament prophets, that he, what he would do in reality three years later, dying for the sins of the world, for all humanity, past, present, and future, and then rising to new life to show that death has been conquered. It's worthwhile thinking about the historical resonance of this action. Moses was the greatest figure in the history of Israel. He took the people through the waters of the Red Sea, the waters of death, to a new life in the promised land. Jesus was somebody greater than Moses. And on the cross, carrying the sins of the entire human race, Jesus passed through the waters of death. And three days later, he rose again to lead his people to a new life in communion with God. Thirdly, in his baptism, Jesus was being revealed to the people of Israel as their long-awaited Messiah. There were supernatural signs, an endorsement from God. John's, Jesus' baptism is mentioned in all four Gospels. It's an important event. And so I'll read you something from Luke's Gospel. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. People saw that in the signs. They didn't understand it. John commented on what he had experienced, John the Baptist. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that so that he might be revealed to Israel. That was John's summary almost of the purpose of his life, the purpose of his whole career as the Baptist, was that Jesus would be revealed to Israel. And in a way, having fulfilled that purpose, John's career faded out. He must become more, I must become less. 
But at that moment when Jesus, when Jesus was being announced to the people, John had a flash of prophetic inspiration. And so he revealed Jesus to the waiting and expectant crowds, not as a conquering king, not as the Messiah they were expecting, but as the Lamb of God. You see, there was a background, an Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah, in his most famous chapter, his greatest passage in Isaiah, he had spoken about a mysterious person who was to come, a suffering servant. And I'll read you some verses from Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. And so, John proclaimed the Messiah to waiting and expectant Israel as the suffering servant of the Lord, the Lamb of God, the next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is probably John's most famous statement. And it actually sums up why Jesus came and what he was coming to do. To take away the sin of the world. And so the days of preparation were ended. The clock started ticking. Jesus had three years to complete his mission because he was now in the public eye. Later he would tell his disciples, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. But not now. This was the time of ministry. These were the days of miracle and wonder. For three years, in a blaze of glory, Jesus cast out demons, healed the sick, raised the dead, did all sorts of amazing things, fed the 5,000. Many were amazed at him. Many followed him. Some loved him. But there were also the disappointed, the critics, the opponents, those who mocked and sneered, those who plotted, this was not the Messiah they looked for, the Messiah they had longed for. Jesus didn't meet their expectations. So let me ask you a question. Does Jesus fulfill your expectations, your hopes, your needs? Nowadays there are still many who turn their backs on him. They mock, they sneer, they, some even spit at the mention of his name. Some ignore him. Some want to learn more. And there are others who love him, who follow him, who suffer for him. Ever since he first appeared, there have been different responses to Jesus. And I think for all of us here, what I would ask you is, what is your response to Jesus? Is he the one that you'd hoped for, longed for, discovered? In the next section of the sermon series, Season of Encounters, the titles come from Mary, by the way, <laughs> we will be looking at different responses to Jesus. Chosen, forgiven, freed, loved, empowered, called. All of the different responses that people had when they met him. In other words, we're going to cover the rest of the Gospels. So let's think about our own response to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your great love, for the great love that brought you to our sinful world to destroy the works of the devil, 
to free us from sin and from death. If we choose to follow you and to place our lives in your hands, you have a great future for each one of us. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.